Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I almost forgot the name of my channel for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where, where am I? Maybe that was a little, little glitch in the matrix there. What life is this again? Um, I forgot to press record. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, for Stephanie's channel, you just missed me almost forgetting the name of my channel. I had, okay, so before we get into this, I, I go through these weird moments in life and it's happened to me since I was a kid and maybe it is part of spiritual development, especially if you've been doing spiritual work many, many lives, where all of a sudden, like my own name sounds weird and foreign. Like all of a sudden, mm -hmm. my own self feels foreign to me. And that used to happen to me when I was a kid a lot. Like all of a sudden, I didn't feel like, like, that. I don't know, it just, it felt very foreign. I don't know if that makes sense, but I was laying in bed last night and all of a sudden I started thinking about my own name. And I think it's because I recorded Monday Mystery yesterday, which is Robert the Doll. And so I was thinking about my name and how the kid gave the doll his name. And I started thinking about my name being a family name. And all of a sudden it just felt very foreign. Everything just felt very, very foreign. Like I was just this uh, soul, just what, which is what we want, right? That's the whole, that's the whole point of spiritual development too, is to be able to rest into the soul, knowing the soul is just like literally watching your life happen like it's it's a reality show i mean i'm sure if patanjali lived in 2022 he would have called it a reality show but five thousand years ago in the sutras when he wrote them they didn't have reality tv but that's basically what's happening so anyway so it's kind of funny i i forgot the name of my actual channel so i of course am joined today with my my two of my besties emmy and stephanie and we are going to be continuing our conversation on shadow work and basically our, our conversations on humaning because humaning, being a human, I'm, I'm hurting, turning it into a verb here. Humaning is, is really hard, and and it's 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 the end. It's easier with coffee. <laughs> it's, it's easier with coffee. Coffee. It's, your coffee. it's easier with psychedelics, which we are going to talk about today. Um, yes, humaning is very very hard, and we're all. And, you know, my my teacher David Greig, one of my teachers, used to say it's the unsolvable riddle. Right? It's like we're trying to learn how to be present and integral in our human lives without being attached to the outcome of our human lives, because being attached to the outcome of our human lives lives means that we are um, not attached to God, but to rather the label of property or nature, which is not eternal. But before we get into psychedelics, there is something I wanted to discuss uh, again about karma and this concept of karma, because um, earlier this week, I put up a video about what consent looks like. Stephanie and I spoke about it yesterday in the priory of scion with these things and we're going to try to keep this on youtube so this thing abby has has something to say about it too um <laughs> and a lot of people are asking about children hello she wants to be involved <laughs> every single time every single time i'm on a video with her around she's got to do this she's got to be she's like it's my show what input would you would you like to tell the audience that you have to poop that you that you wouldn't go for me Next life, I know for sure I want I want her colon in my next life. Most of my problems. No, she poops solved. like four times a day. Most of my problems would be solved if I had her colon. So. One of my nicknames for her is Poopasaurus Rex. Okay. So <laughs> like she oh is my just gosh. She's got That's a she's so skinny. It just runs right got a city situation. Okay. <laughs> it's this, as, as Cindy said, it's the spooky dookies for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so, and I've got, you know, I'm not a mother. And so I'm glad I got my two friends here who are mothers. And I, but I do understand the complexities of talking about karma and children. Because we do know, um, spiritually, especially with like the energetic body, that a child's chakras are developing as their body is developing too, right? We can look a baby isn't born with its seventh chakra, only with its first one. And so we do understand that there is spiritual development as the body is developing as well. However, in saying that, the soul of the child is the same as it was when it was a day old, as it is when it's 80 years old. And so according to the law of one, and this actually makes sense to me from a very logical perspective, yes, it is our job as adults to protect our children. You know, as, as an aunt, I, part of my job is to protect my nephew and my nieces, and I would give my life for them absolutely 100%. But there also is something we have to understand as well, and that's the boundary 
of, of the karma that the child has agreed to. What do I mean by that? And I want to specify too, because I think in the Western world, we have a very um, ignorant view on karma. All karma is, is cause and effect. That's all it is. It's your work. You know, the fact that um, I woke up this morning, that the karma of me waking up this morning meant that I took a shower and I'm here filming with these ladies. The fact that I put on makeup means that now I can turn the camera on and film. Does that make sense? The fact that you, you, you look at it as cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. That's all karma is. We label things as bad karma or good karma, but with cause and effect or action and reaction, we're looking at learning phases. So karma, again, in the spiritual world, we call your karma, your work. It's just your work. And we don't come to this human life to not work. We come here because we have karma we need to work through. We have things we have to work through. And so a child, even though in our society rules, children are not eligible for consent or whatever, a child, though, according to the law of one, the minute they're born, they are responsible for their karma. So what does that mean? That means that that child's soul contract, our soul contracts when we were born, started the minute we took our first breath. Yeah? So that means that your child, the soul of your child, just like our soul, sat down and created a contract before popping into your womb. They even picked, I mean, Stephanie, we've talked about this. When the, the, the sperm and the egg meet, the energy of that sperm, so whatever the father is dealing with, if the father is in a low point or an angry point or that egg, if the mother is carrying that energy, the child agreed to that. The child agreed to take that on. We, we call that inherited karma. The child agreed for whatever reason that those energies needed to be present in their development to learn whatever lesson they decided they needed to learn. And so once that happens, once that sperm hits that egg, it's the child's responsibility then to work through that energy. It's not the parents. The parent, you're there to support your children and help them, but you also have to allow them to make decisions and to kind of give them that free reign. Does that make sense? And so when it comes to this thing with children, and I know this is very, very confusing, but if a child is screaming in a doctor's office, screaming, no to one of these and the parents and the doctor enforce it on the child, then that means the parents and the doctor are going to have to then pay that karma back because they just broke that child's consent. All right. Now, if the child willingly agrees to this, then that's that child consenting for whatever reason. I know that's hard for us to comprehend in our bodies because in our property, our nature, we think we need to control, but you made a really good point yesterday, Stephanie, like we have to give up that control. We can set boundaries for our kids to try to protect them as best we can, but we also can't hover in control. Does that make sense? The law of one is very matter of fact about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of parents, because they want to protect their children, they view their children as an extension of themselves. And it's really doing a disservice to them if we if we look at them that way, because then we try to take away their pain or prevent them from, you know, of course, we're going to try to prevent them from having pain. But we we have neither the right nor the ability to take away their pain. Their pain is their pain. They can either sit and stew in it or they can learn and grow from it but it's theirs. And if, if we're trying to take that away because we see them as an extension of ourselves, then they're not, we're not giving them the opportunity to work through that stuff that they agreed to come here with and work on. And that's, that's the whole thing you have to remember too, is they agreed to that. Mm -hmm. they, they agreed to do that. Just like all the pain we've been through. You think go back to your, your, your whole life and think about the pain you've been through we do pick our parents for a reason because we are, there are energetic components that our parents give us that we decided as a soul, we needed to work through. And yes, you do kind of cluster and travel as souls together in a grouping. I get that. I mean, the interesting thing, I, I had a past life reading done. I had a lot of past life readings done, but a really, really, really long time ago. 
And it came up with my father, how many different relationships I've had with my, you know, that's the thing. My father hasn't always been my father in every life. In some lives, he was my friend. In some lives, he was a brother or a sister. And, you know, and so when we look at the compatibility with each souls, even your child, even though in this life, they made an agreement to take on some of your physical energy through your, your DNA, they haven't always been your child. In some lives, they could have been your parent. You know what I'm saying? So when we look at what them, is the irony of that one, <laughs> I mean, I, there were many lives. Listen, in the past life I did, there were many lives where I was my parents' parents, which makes sense to me because, I mean, you met my mom, Stephanie. I feel like I'm way older than my parents, like way older. Like I'm, I feel like I'm ancient compared to both of my parents. But in and my, and my uh, family as well, I was always the the weird one with the wise wisdom and they're just looking at me like what <laughs> yeah so, but there's a, so and you would go back and we can like i've said this like i you know i you know i've always said if i had a daughter especially that i would really want her to have a really good relationship with her father like that was always really important to me because i didn't have that growing up i don't have a daddy i don't my, my dad is you know i have a great had a great grandfather but you know so but but even though that's something that's kind of a, a wound in me I, I recognize it for what it is. And I've learned a lot through that experience. And now I understand why I agreed to do this merry-go-right again with his soul as my dad, because I, there was something I needed to learn from that experience. Right. And, and that's in my Angelo said, I know people are eh, about my Angelo, but this is true. She said, your children are not a part of you. They just come through you. They Our purpose you. for them is to make sure they have a roof over their head. They got food to eat. Their diapers changed when they're young, just to guide them as much as we know how to. And then you let them go. Yeah. I mean, you always will love them. Absolutely. You love your, your children, but there's only so much you can do. So I've been in a situation where my child has never been the easiest. Okay. He was an easy toddler, very easy baby. Um, but by the time he was probably three or four years old, that's when things started to get a little wonky and I was dealing with a child with a monstrous temper by the time he turned 12 it got so bad that I I was like suicidal ideation it was that bad so you know it's um he took on the karma of his father and his father's a very angry man very very angry man he's he's a narcissist very violent um but I had to learn to work with that and figure that stuff out. And I didn't even know about this stuff done. I wish I had so that I knew better. And I've gotten to the point. So, yeah, some of it was, you know, childhood these, the, the heavy metal detox. I, you know, I had to heavy metal detox him. And now he is, you know, Bryce, you've met Tyler. He's a great kid. He's a really, really like empathic yeah. kid, psychic kid. He doesn't know how psychic he is, but he's very psychic, right? Mm -hmm. um very intuitive he um he makes my day like he is such a good kid but at the same time he's a very negative kid because he's got a lot of karma built up um in terms of whether it's he took on mine and his father's or it's his own that he's built for himself in this well, let's stop right there because he didn't actually take on your karma or his father's karma he took the energy of of what existed in your dna well, that's, that's what i meant that's yeah. what I meant. So I want to yeah. so not so I, I, I want like you're not gonna your kids are gonna solve your problems for you. No, no, you're, that's what I meant. Me. I meant the energy. Yeah. I, it yeah. came out wrong. So the you know, I've had to deal with that for, for several years and it's been a learning lesson for me. But I've also had to kind of let go a little bit and say, you know what, he's gotta figure this out on his own. There's only so much I can do and say to help him. He chose this. And I actually said to him one day, you chose this. And I kind of made him think a little bit. I'm like, before you were born, you chose this. And of course, his reaction was, oh, you're talking about your hoo jubu stuff again. But, you know, if he's got to make a choice one day. Is he going to continue being miserable because of his past? Or is he going to move forward and learn from it? I can't do that for him. And I have to really let go and let him live the experience that he chose. Yeah. 
And that's it, allowing them to live the experience that they chose. And we think about that too. We know with any type of spiritual development, there has to be deconstruction before there can be creation. There has to be friction in order for creation to begin. And so you look at your, your like Tyler, for example, he is very gifted. He's a great kid. He's super smart. He's very talented. He's very intuitive, but he picked up a, a life pattern that was going to give him. So if you look at it this way, he picked a trajectory that gave him friction. That temper, that anger, that's nothing bigger friction than that, internal friction. He picked that because friction is necessary. Mm -hmm. You can't have a perfect childhood and a perfect life where everything's hunky-dory and just great and wonderful, rainbows and butterflies. And then in your 20s, all of a sudden, you're this intuitive, wise person helping people. So if we look at it that way, if you look at the obstacles your child is facing as not a burden or a curse, but a blessing as something that was given to them in order to fulfill whatever they needed to do in this life, then you start to back off more and let them go through that. Of course, you're going to help them and hold their hand and guide them. And you're not going to allow them in a situation that's going to in their life or something, of course, but, but you have to like, let go. And that's kind of what the law of one talks about. And I, and I, you know, I've noticed, um, again, I don't have children, but when I was a kid, when we were kids, my parents were really not that involved in our lives. Like they, they were involved in the sense that they knew where we were and they knew what we were doing at school. But as far as like what we were getting up to with our own friends or anything like that, they had no idea. Like they would take us to our piano lessons, our dance classes. They'd drop us off, leave us, come pick us back up. Now I see parents sit there and watch and watch their kids. You know, I remember as a little kid playing outside on bikes with my neighborhood friends, my parents had no idea where we were. We just had to be home by a certain, by the time it was got dusk, we had to be home. Mm-hmm. You know, we were left at home by ourselves. Like, I think I was eight years old. The first time I was left at home by myself, we were just given. And, and you know, it's so funny. I, I was, I've watched stranger things a few times on uh, Netflix. This filmed here in Atlanta. That's mainly why I watched it. Cause I wanted to see the landmarks, but I was watching an interview with the children who are acting in this series. And of course it's set in the eighties. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting because the director and the producers were saying that they had to like talk to the children about what life was like in the eighties that no, your parents had no idea where you were. That was normal. You just to go out on your bikes and get into mischief and solve. We were solving problems by ourselves mm-hmm. without our parents intervention. And so in a lot of ways, even though there are some things I wish my parents had done with me, like I wish I had grown up going to a yoga shala and seeing practices and being spoke. But in a lot of ways, my parents were gave us that gift of being young and having to solve problems by ourselves. My mother wouldn't even step in if my, my my sister and I didn't fight that much at all, really. But the one thing my mom said once, you two are the only family you have. That's it. And then she walked away. And the only time she would ever intervene is if, if it, which would never did get physical. So she never intervened. She may would make us figure it out. We would have to figure it out for ourselves. You know, I remember in school, when I was in school, I'd like ask my parents for help with something. And my mom would be like, I've already done this. You got to learn it. So there was more responsibility, I feel like, put on us as children that actually was good for us than maybe there is today. What do you guys think? Yeah, I I agree. Um, I parent more like how I was raised as far as like giving the kids freedom um, because I do think that that's valuable and important. Um, but I, I watch out for any type of abuse, even subtle abuse, like name calling and snide remarks. And I do not allow that at all whatsoever. And if it happens, I walk them through the apology and forgiveness process. And I, I emphasize the forgiveness because, you know, I think a lot of parents, will have their kids apologize, but the forgiveness part of it, even if they don't feel like they want to forgive, I'll still walk them through that. <laughs> so they have that experience and I, I show them and tell them the importance of forgiveness, that it's not about the other person. It's about setting yourself free because 100%. if you don't forgive someone, you are the one entrapped. You are the one that's miserable. You are the one that is drinking the poison. So, you know, even though little kids don't understand, just having been being shown 
the process of apologizing and forgiveness, I think is really, really, really important. And my children that are adults now um, are able to forgive people and move on. And I, I guess I just didn't realize how important that was. And I'm seeing now that they're adults, how important that was. And I'm re really grateful that I was given that insight. And what you're doing is you're teaching them, which I think is the best thing for a parent to do is you're not, you're not stopping experiences, but you're teaching, you're, you're coaching them through. And you're right. My mother wouldn't even let us say the word shut up growing up. Like if we said shut up mm -hmm. to each other, we got in trouble. Like mm -hmm. that was disrespectful. We couldn't say that. Um, you know, that, and that, that, in that way, yeah, you're teaching them through walking them through life so that they can continue on the trajectory that they're supposed to do. I know for me, like with not having, you know, being more independent as a kid and kind of being having parents that were hands off when it came to come to that. I think about, I went to college in London when I was, you know, 18 years old, I was traveling by myself at 17. I was in, in France by myself. Um, and then as an adult, I was very easy for me to go on a plane and go to India by myself because I, from a very young age, we were, we had to figure it out on our own. And, um, and I'm grateful for that because my parents did that. I was able to then fulfill my trajectory of what my soul needed to do without a lot of fear, without a lot of hesitation. I'm very comfortable in airports. I'll figure it out. Like that, that's how my, my parents were. And I, and I, think and I was the opposite. <laughs> so maybe it's taught from that experience. Yeah. So I, so I was raised by my aunt and uncle, um, from the age of five and a half to 18. And I, there was some things that I had a lot of freedoms with. Now, my two cousins who I would consider brother and sister, and God help me if any of them watch this particular video, but it is what it is. Facts are facts. So if they hate me for it, whatever, I don't even care anymore. <laughs> but they were definitely given a lot more freedoms than me. And I was always told, I don't want you to end up like your mom. You know, so I was then smothered with, you know, I couldn't do a lot of stuff. And I mean, I was able to do, I wasn't completely sheltered, but I was definitely more sheltered than they were. And they were able to go fly off to different places all by themselves, but no problem by the time they were 18. Now I didn't travel for the first time alone. Well, I traveled to Florida by myself um, when I was 17, but that was it. And then never again until this year. And that was a very scary thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, now, meanwhile, I kind of rebelled at 18 because of how I was raised. And then, of course, had a child. <laughs> and I had to learn that way. Yeah. You know, so I didn't learn that independence as a child. I learned it as an adult stuck in a very adult situation as a very young adult, still, still, you know, coming into that seventh chakra. So I had to learn the hard way. Um, so in my experience with my son, I found myself holding on to him too tightly sometimes because he would get bullied all the time, whether it be by a teacher or another student in the class. Um, he's been bullied by his father. He's been bullied by a lot of people. And, um, so I found myself having us, I, I struggled to let go. It wasn't until about a couple of years ago, I started to let go of a little bit. He's been staying home by himself for short periods of time since he was 10. Um, he'd get off the bus and be by himself for about an hour and a half till I got home from work and started off that way. Now he can be home all day by himself and he's perfectly fine. He's 15. So, I mean, he's only a couple of years away from 18, obviously. So, um, it, it got more and more time in between where I could leave him home alone. And he, he's perfectly fine and responsible. Now he can cook himself lunch in the microwave or whatnot. He's perfectly fine. Same. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> to work too. <laughs> but in the last two years, so last year, um, I, I forced myself to just let go. And his friend said, I'm going to the fair, the local fair down the street you want to go with me. And I knew the parents would just leave the boys to just do their own thing. They're both, you know, Tyler was 14. His friend was 13. And I thought to myself at that age, I was going around the fair by myself because I did. 
I mean, granted, I was with a whole group of friends. Um, so I did have that type of freedom as a kid. But I said, okay, God, please keep them safe. I'm letting go. It was very scary for me. But he had the time of his life. He was he had so much fun. And I saw the joy on his face of having that freedom and that independence. And yeah, he was pushed to go on rides he would have never went on otherwise by himself. And he, but he had a blast and he came home and for two hours straight told me all about it. And I could see that joy. And so this year it was like a no brainer. He actually walked to the fair all by himself because it was in walking distance and um, met a few people there. So, <coughs> you know, he, I, I've learned to let go. And in terms of his emotions, he tends to repeat, repeat every day what he's upset about and i'm like okay so what, what are you going to learn from it what are you learning from it and of course he doesn't get it yet but what i you know it's it's kind of like a baby where you hold a baby and and you say okay say hi to grandma you wave bye-bye you know like they don't know what you're saying yeah but over and over again they're going to start to learn and pick up oh that's how that's what i do you know that's that's you say bye to whoever, you know, you wave goodbye or you say goodbye. It's it's like one of those things. So I know he's not going to get it up until probably 18, 19 years old. I understand that, but I want him to start processing it now. Like start thinking, okay, what am I learning from this experience? Why did I choose this path in my life? Yeah. Well, now I, I was just thinking like, man, when we were young, travel even when we were traveling with our parents, we had to keep up with our own passports as a very young children. Like we had to make sure my mom wasn't keeping up with it. We had to keep up with our passports. And I was just thinking about that as you were speaking, how young we were. And I always, but, but I think too, what, what you're allowing to happen when you give your kids that responsibility or give them kind of that freedom to have that responsibility is you're also allowing them the opportunity to make a mistake. Cause that's how we learn is through making a mistake, yeah. you know, and that's how we learn how to, why things are important and why they're not important is through the mistakes we make, not from the things we get right now. Thank God I've never lost my passport. But if I had lost my passport as a child, then my parents would have walked me through going to the embassy, filing for a new pass. Like what, what does that look like? And so now at 39 with the amount of, I mean, I've traveled all over the world. I've been all over the world multiple times. I know what to do. If I were to lose my passport, I know exactly what to do. You know, something like that. You know, you go to the embassy, you, you know, it's, 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 um, so when you think about that, like we can't stop mistakes are not, they're not bad. Mistakes are necessary. Um, we were talking about, which might be a good, uh, good, uh, hinge into the psychedelics. Cause we were talking about this before we started filming. You know that you're on a, you've, you've, you've mastered a level of spiritual learning when you can see mistakes or darkness as not something to be feared, but something to learn from. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, um, you know, there's this, uh, with this radio station here in Atlanta, they call it the wussification of America. And they'll, they'll talk about these stories of what kids get away with today that we never got away with. You know, when we were growing up, not everyone got a trophy. Mm -hmm. Only the person that won got a trophy. And there's just as much of a valuable lesson in that for the winner as there is for the one who didn't win. You learn more from not winning than you do from winning. Mm -hmm. What's that saying? It doesn't matter how many times you fall down. It just matters how many times you get back up. Yeah. Yeah. We learn far more from our mistakes than from when things go easy. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm really good. My, the subjects I excelled in obviously were history, English. That's what I studied in school. Like, you know, that's, that's what I excelled in. Um, that's what I did in Los Angeles for a really long time. This, the subjects that I hated were math and science, math, mainly I hated math. I thought math was the, most, the boringest, most uninspiring. I hated it so much. And I did not but I remember somebody telling me once, my God, you would make such a great math teacher because you, you had to teach yourself how to do this in order to get through your classes. Mm -hmm. I would probably make a shitty history teacher because our English literature teacher, because I can read a William Faulkner book. And if you've ever studied Faulkner, 
he's hard to read because he doesn't use punctuation. He doesn't write in linear time. But I was the, I remember the first year I studied Faulkner was in my advanced English class, American Lit class, my sophomore year in high school. And this is when I got really sick too. But I could read a Faulkner book and tell you exactly what was going on. And I remember my teacher being like, holy shit, you get this. And it's all, but that's just how my mind works. But math, on the other hand, that was not how. And I've told you guys before, even in science, I had a chemistry teacher in high school. I asked a question in chemistry class and he literally like stopped the class and was like, aren't you a Bryce? Like, isn't your mom's family? The, they're all doctors. Are, isn't that your, your mom's family? Why don't you get this? Heretically from your DNA, you're supposed to understand this. And I was like, I'm sorry, man. Like this doesn't, this, this is not something that I'm, this is not in my wheelhouse as we say now. So I remember when someone said, Ted, you would make a really good math teacher. That's because that's what I struggled with, hmm. what I struggled with. And so therefore, and same in yoga, the, the teachers that are the best teachers out there are the ones who have struggled the most in their practice, in their emotional life, the ones that have been through trauma. They are well, the that's most. because they're relatable. You can relate to, they relate to the student because they were once the student struggling. Well, they're, and they're still the student. That's the thing about yoga teachers is we're never, we're never not students. We're always students. So it will, and they know, they understand friction and they understand they've gotten to the other side of sorrow. They've gotten to the other side of suffering. And so they understand the pains and they've, they've learned how to work with it in a different way. And so back to like the radio people saying the wussification of America, is this why the law of one focuses so much on us stepping back from our children is because we're, we're imposing so much of our will on our children that we're creating a negative timeline by not allowing them to have their free will and their own consent. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. if you impose your, your will onto someone else, whether it's your child or another person, that's negative. And yes, it's a kind of a gray area because there are things you are going to have to impose your will upon with your kids. They can't run with scissors. You could let them run, run with scissors and poke their eyes out, but where is the, but you have the wisdom of what's going to happen. So this is a very, very interesting dance. But when it comes to this thing with children, there are no placebos, guys. The children who got this, they got the real thing. And as sad as that is, as unfortunate as that is, because some children have passed away, we have to understand that the children's, they, they, a child's soul is the same as our soul. They made an agreement before taking this life as to what they, they wanted to experience. And they'll live again. Or they'll work through it. I think a lot of them, because a lot of kids now, according to the law of one, are in fourth density bodies anyway. So it might affect them differently than it would affect you and me because our DNA structure is different from theirs. Does that make sense? I know people are going to be upset about this, but I would really... Well I also think a lot of truthers are putting a lot of fear about this. Um, no, I'm not talking about the ones that are saying there's placebos because there's plenty of those, but I'm talking about like some people just keep going on and on and on about the horrifying stuff about it. Don't listen to that. Yeah. Like that, that, that should not be a part of your daily routine is listening to that shit. Um, what you need to focus on is yourself <laughs> and your, your own shadow work and everything like that. Um, and I think we, I think it's just a distraction really. And I think it's a sphere porn. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different truthers out there saying it takes away your soul and, and all this other stuff. And it's just like, Oh, come on. Um, how do they know that? I mean, how, exactly. how could you possibly know I don't know that that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's like question everything your that you soul hear. in this lifetime. And this it's something you're going to have to at all. It's got, it's got to be something you do have to work through, but what they're not grasping is those who did get this can, they, they, they agree to that in their soul contract beforehand yeah. anyways. Yeah. That, there's no controlling who got it. And it, it is what it is. Yeah. You, you, you agree to your time of death as well. And as sad as that is, and I cannot imagine losing a child. I could not, I, I don't know how I would be able to go on with my life. If my nephew or niece has passed away is I could not imagine that. But even for children who passed away, they picked that before they took this life. Mm 
for that experience. And guess what? As a parent, your soul was in an agreement with that child as well that you would experience the loss of that child. Nothing shows the experience. Nothing, nothing happens to you in this world, big like that, major like that, that you didn't agree to beforehand for the experience to learn from it. Your soul, you can't, you can't sell your soul accidentally. Uh -uh. You can't do that accidentally. You can't get this and then, oops, all of a sudden your soul's gone. That's not how that works. We know now what this nefarious group do in their rituals. It's an actual ritual. It's a full on summoning ritual agreements being made it's they're, not they're, they're consenting to sell it yes they are consenting to work with the demons they are in full awareness of what they are doing so if you got this that's not so the the powers that be want you to think you took a mark of the beast but again, that goes to religious programming. It was supposed to be set up to make you think that you sold your soul. But selling of a soul is something that the person is willing, consenting to, and full aware of what they are doing. Yeah. And they don't care regardless. They, For money, fame, fortune, whatever it is, they are fully aware of what they are doing. And I will say, too, a little secret. If you do sell your soul, you can always get it back. Because it's yours. Mm -hmm. I've heard that from many people. All you got to say is, I want it back. I know and void my contract. I've heard that from many, many people. So, you guys, your soul is your soul. And I think, too, it comes from this thing as well, that people are still very confused about the body the identity and the soul. And these are two different things. Even though the body is the expression of the soul, it's the Shakti of the soul, it's not the soul, right? The soul is its own thing. The body needs the soul, but the soul doesn't need the body. Mm -hmm. So if you get one of these and it changes your personality or it, you know, your loved one all of a sudden is, because I've seen that a lot of people who got this, they've gotten very nasty. Yeah. But that's, that's their psychological brain which is not their soul. Does that make sense? So you, as Emmy and Stephanie, they know this, their soul isn't Emmy or Stephanie. Their soul is pure consciousness and love. It's just my costume right now. Just your costume. Yes. It's the avatar. It's my the avatar. avatar. Your dog, Abby, your dog, Abby. She's not really Abby. She's a soul. I chose a funny avatar <laughs> this time around. <laughs> <laughs> A short, stumpy. You know, I do look at you. Both girls are both beautiful, but I do look at some people. I'm like, interesting choice. <laughs> <laughs> what? I tell myself all the time. Choice. Interesting choice. <laughs> when you were looking at the two people who were going to be your parents, and you're looking at the full DNA spread of what colors you could pick from, why did you pick that nose? <laughs> 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 those lopsided boobs like i don't know what, what, what the other? why did you pick that i chose tits on a stump okay <laughs> sometimes i think i was a guy even though i think i've been a female in most of my lives um sometimes i think i was a man in a past life because of the size of my boobs i was like i must have been real excited creating a female body <laughs> <laughs> Because these boobs are really big for my frame. So. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we can laugh about it, right? But next life, it'll be a totally different. So for some reason, and I don't know, you know, we're, I know we're, we're go through amnesia. So our whole soul contract, we're still trying to remember. But for some reason, for me, I picked a white girl from Georgia with these two people as my parents for some experience. So even the race, even the medical history you have, even though the medical history is your own issues coming through, but you can in inherit that energy karma from your parents, which still is an emotional issue coming through that your soul needs to work on. But everything you, if you grew up, grew up really, really poor, you're not a victim to that poverty. You picked it for a reason. There was some, mm -hmm. some experience 
within that that your soul needed to learn or if you decided that this time you were going to be born to an extremely wealthy family there was some experience that your soul needed to learn about itself through the external forces that created that experience that that life does that make sense absolutely yeah mm -hmm. so um so yes yeah, so i i want you guys anyway so that's your karma, your karma. And I don't want people to be afraid of karma. There's nothing to be afraid of when it comes to karma. Karma is I think people identify karma as a bad thing because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, karma is a bitch. You, mm -hmm. you hear that over and over again. It's misused, though. That word is so misused because like you say, Bryce, all it is is your work. It's your cause like, and effect. Yeah, it's, you know, if you were to you go to a job nine to five, well, that's that's karma. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? That's your work. And so you go to a nine to five job, another aspect and their karmic reaction to that nine to five job is you have a paycheck. Right? If you which then is your dharma. Which then is your, yeah. So if you if you don't eat and you get really skinny, that's the cause and effect. That's the karma of not eating. If you eat too much, you gain weight. That's the karma. It's just cause and effect. It's just action and reaction. And that's everything within the physical world is based off of karma, off of action and reaction action and reaction and part of the the yoga journey is specifically is to be able to experience your karma let it play out experience the emotions but not holding on to the emotions so like tyler for example you're saying he's reliving these things over and over again so part of his experience is learning how to observe the feelings of frustration see them for what they are but not hold on to them let them go because we, as humans, we put the label of bad or good on things. Mm -hmm. Bad or good. We label it as such. The action, what happened to us is just action and reaction. The action of having sex results in a baby. If you look at it like that, it's just the reaction to having from that sperm eating the egg. But we're the ones that put that emotion on it. That's what makes us human beings. And that's what defines the experience. Yeah. You look yeah. at like there's there are people out there. I'm I'm pretty like for me, I, I tolerate pain pretty a uh, physical pain pretty well. For example, when I broke my sacrum, I finished my practice that day with a broken sacrum. Like I'm stubborn when it comes to physical pain. But somebody else could stump their toe and spend the whole day crying about the pain. Right? It's perception, it's how we're perceiving something. I hope that makes and sense. And on the pain. Do what? depends on the pain <laughs> I, I even my, my parents used to tell me that all the time that they never knew like if i was really hurt or not because i would just i just took emotional pain i'm a slobbering crying wreck but physical pain i could take it um i remember when i was i was at the doctor for some reason as a kid and they had done an x-ray on i think it was when I, maybe when i broke my ankle as a kid they had done an x-ray and up and it got a bit of my my shin bone and there was a scar on my shin bone. And the doctor goes, oh, you've broken your leg before. And I was like, no. And my mother was like, no. And he goes, yeah, you have a scar. You broke your leg. He was like, probably when you were little, really little and your parents just didn't notice, but it healed itself. And I think my mother felt terrible. Oh, but I wow. literally had a scar on my shin where I had broken my leg as a kid. And no one, I guess I just didn't say anything. And I just kept playing, maybe hobbled a little bit. And it healed itself. But then, so you see that if you, if you think about perception, just think about that with people. I'm sure everybody watching right now knows people who can take pain and people who can't. It's all the perception of the person carrying the pain, right? So people say you got to toughen up. You got to, you know, it's, it's, um, you got to experience it, but you also, it's your perception. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we have to let our, and back to the kids, like we have to allow children the experience so that they can create their own perceptions so that they can live their own karma and their own dharma because they are a soul just like you are your child is no different from anybody else on this planet they have a journey and they have a path they're a soul that's trying to know itself that's all they're doing they're a soul trying to know itself and trying to return itself home to god and knowing itself is how they're going to find that that connection again with god and if we stand in the way of them experiencing their karma then we're standing in the, in the way of them actually living that. Yeah. So I, anyway, uh, I hope that makes sense, but let's move on to psychedelics. Psychedelics. <laughs>